I'd like to thank AI Buffalo for partnering up with us on this uh, event, and hopefully you get a lot out of it. We hope uh, this is very informative for you. Today, we're going to talk about building audiences, and it's actually going to operate from a very kind of strategic level at first, and then towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about tactics. But I think it's very important for us to not dive straight into tactics because without a proper strategy, it might not be as effective. So for some context setting, I'm George, and Sylvia's here with me. One thing that's just important to note is that we both come from the industry, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of a quick rundown on myself. My background is both in landscape architecture and architecture. I have a bachelor's in landscape and a master's and have worked at different offices like Architectonica Geo, which is a pretty large firm to international firm to firms like Moss and The Living uh, in New York. Um, I've spent a lot of my career in, in technology working on architecture workflow issues, whether at Iris VR where I was running product to WeWork, where I was running global, well, I was part of global strategy there before joining Monica. And uh, Sylvia, you want to give a quick rundown on yourself? Thanks, George. I actually graduated with my master's uh, and bachelor's from SUNY University at Buffalo. So that's how we have this connection to AIA Buffalo. After graduating, I worked in New York City, first at a small firm, then moving to Perkins Eastman for five, six years. And then most recently in the fall, joined Monograph as a marketing manager. We're continuing to just give back to the industry and create resources to really try to push this um, profession and industry to the place we want it to be or would like it to be. Thanks, George. That sums up our, our definitely what drives us. So thank you for sharing that, Sylvia. So today we're going to talk uh, first a little bit about a brief history of marketing and architecture, just to set the stage about why are we here or like how did we get here. Then we're going to talk about developing a strategy. We're going to talk, talk about channels, which I'll reiterate, but it's basically like how do you get your message out there? What are the vehicles or mediums that you use to get your message out there? Funnels are more how to think and organize step by step how a potential customer becomes a client. And then we'll recap towards the end. All right, brief history. So this is a really simple outline. It only covers from 1909 to 1980 because we wanted to talk more about why has marketing stagnated within the industry in general? And so to be very frank, right? 1909, Code of Ethics gets written and in it, it, ban it outright bans any form of advertising. I think the quote explicitly was something along the lines of it's a very ungentlemanlike behavior to advertise yourself. In context, this was during a time when advertising was just really coming into play. Like people were, this is the, the age in which people were like advertising tonics and mixtures and like all sorts of maybe shady practices. And architects thought as a profession, they were above that. And so they, they viewed marketing in a general sense as beneath the profession. Obviously this has problems. And we'll talk a little bit about what it meant back then to operate this way as a firm. And then like going down the line, what we start to see is this kind of evolution over time, right? Where like, we do see architects enter the public consciousness. Ralph Adam Cray is the first architect on the cover of Time Magazine. I think throughout the history of Time Magazine, we see maybe about seven architects that have ever been profiled on there. But it's just really interesting to note that this is the start of architects actually also being, having a broader, let's say general, just part of the, the broader cultural consciousness. And as we move down the line, the AI as the governing body starts to have changes of their own, right? Reacting to certain conditions before there was the idea of fee schedules, right? The AIA approved the idea of like there being a set fee schedule for all architects across the US. They updated that so that states could update their own fee schedules based off of local parameters. Down the line, um, we're joined by other organizations like the NSPE, which is for professional engineers, they also end up banning advertising in the 60s, which is pretty interesting development that they also adopted that late in the game in some sense. By 1971, though, external pressures around restraining trade, this idea of the, the organization AI having a monopoly because it's a unified body of professionals. So the Justice Department comes in and starts changing that relationship to the point where we only up to the 1980s actually start to open up the idea of architects can actually start to market to other people. The key takeaway here is that if you think about it, 1980, we still have a, a very large contingent of firm owners and firm leadership that have come out of a, an, an environment in which marketing was not a good practice, right? It was not seen as something that a firm should be doing. And so that leads to this notion that you really get most of your contacts through word of mouth, 
and very one-to-one relationship building. And the idea of one-to-many uh, relationship building is thrown aside because it's just looked down would be the profession. So what are the channels then from history? If marketing has been looked down upon, then how have people been getting work? Direct advertisement has been the thing that people have looked down on. And that includes like putting ads in newspapers, putting ads in yellow pages, putting ads in lifestyle journals. Notably, Frank Lloyd Wright did a lot of this. He would put like ads for framed housing, basically, where you can buy a house uh, from a catalog. Um, but anyway, like what this is showing is a list of the different ways in which historically architects have been able to put their, the word out there about what they're doing, who they are, what they care about, and then ultimately how to find them. So then the way you could look at this organizationally is that it's linearly, it's tracing the history, but then also from top to bottom. It's not super accurate. It's just kind of a, a gist of it, right? But I, I think it's important to note that it, when we even think about like the a treaties, right? Like it, it's helpful to know that like when Vitruvius is writing the 10 books of architecture, he's actually writing it as promotional material for his own services. And this was very common, like Leonardo da Vinci writing profusely about how good he was as like an engineer when he had no formal training and all these other things like new people market themselves. And the most famous architects have actually understood this very deeply and have built out their own networks, whether through various means, through PR, through institutions, they built the channels by which they can then find more and more work. But the reality is that today it's different. Now, anyone, there are no more gatekeepers. That's a kind of a key takeaway here too, is that when we start to move down the past 10 years, when it comes to the emergence of social media, there are no gatekeepers anymore. You don't have to rely on existing institutions to put the word out there. You don't have to rely on, I would say, even the idea of like press releases is something that can be questioned today, even though we'll talk a little bit about that. And, and what this also traces to some extent is also how people have been given information too, and how that has changed the consciousness of people. That is to say that people, when they're thinking about getting a house built, operate very differently today in how they find answers to their questions than they did back in the 80s even. So I think that's important to set the stage is that the assumptions that most of the industry still operates on when it comes to marketing have completely shifted. It's like the sand is shifted underneath your feet. And for many people, it's hard to recognize that and hard to really make sense of what that means. Okay, so what we want to get here at the end of this talk is this idea of moving away from reactive marketing to proactive marketing. What is an idea of reactive marketing? It's basically waiting for the phone to ring where you have really no control over the situation, waiting for your previous client to potentially have a new project to then hire you for. Again, something you have no control over, no predictability. Submitting to an open RFP. I know this is challenging because this is actually where the definition of marketing is more rallied around. From our perspective, where we come from, which is now technology, marketing is not RFPs. We call that more like sales enablement. Yes, that could, in, in some theory, live within a marketing organization. It can also live under a sales organization, or in this case, business development. And, and, and sometimes those, those things are muddy too in architecture for many different reasons. But this idea of just like waiting to the very end of a stage where someone might not even know who you are, there's no brand affinity, no brand loyalty or anything like that. And you're kind of just shooting your shot in a sense by trying to have this document that can explain everything really condensely and like attract someone. It's a very late stage optimization. And what we want to talk about is how to generate demand, how to generate desire for people to come to you, know who you are, and actually invite you to RFPs maybe in the, in the future because they actually know who you are. And so what this leads to is obviously you no control. You don't know where parties are going to come from. You kind of just, you really try to be very tactical, less strategic. And then you might take on any project regardless of fit because of that, you have no choices. You have no optionality. When we move to proactive marketing, we're trying to really deeply understand who do we want to draw in as our potential customer? How do we want to best communicate that to them? And then we might even be able to move other levers like monetization. When we talk about value, one of the things that we find very interesting talking to so many architects and this idea of we don't want to sell hours, we want to sell value. But then when you talk about how do you define value, it gets murky. And the problem is there's a big struggle with understanding how value maps over to the type of people that you want to bring. And we'll talk about some examples of people who actually, when you have a really strong brand, value changes, right? Like the perception of value is very different. And so that changes how you monetize your services. 
And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then also um, when you move to proactive marketing, you can afford to have a tighter go, no go framework for accepting clients because you're not under that pressure of knowing like where your next project is going to come from. And so that means that you actually have a better success in project delivery, better success downstream of getting more referrals because you're picking the right clients that are the right people to help enable that for you. Developing a strategy. So what's the foundation? We're not going to dive too deep into some of this. This is a kind of, there's a lot of resources online to talk more about this, but at the very, at the very basic, like when, before we even talk about digital marketing, we need to talk about the foundation here, which is you need to know your why, your what, your how, and your who. So your, why should anyone care about working with you? What are you bringing? What, what is your purpose as an organization that people will align to? Right. We live in an age where people care more about the people, the, you know, not to get too philosophical, right, but like corporations operate as people today in many senses. And you see that play out through social media, you see it through other uh, different ways. But there's a sense that like people want to align with organizations because of the values that they hold. And so this idea, it, it's not just for this purpose. It's also this impacts who you hire, how you hire, how you retain. Having a very clear sense of purpose is very powerful for any organization. Then from there, it's the what. Okay, what do we believe in fundamentally? Like, why are we here? And then what, is, what do we fundamentally believe is going to get us there as part of your values and things that you care about? And then how is the strategy aligned to that? Ultimately, how are we going to enable this vision that we have, this mission that we're on? How are we going to get there? And then the team is who do we need to bring on board to get there? Hopefully, they align with all the three different, the three things above. Okay. Now we're narrowing in, all right? So now we're talking very concretely about setting up a marketing strategy that's also a service strategy that kind of go in hand in hand because without this, the other stuff just is very low impact. So when we think about this, think about it through six different lenses that they all add up to each other. One is defining who cares about your mission, right? Like this is ultimately, and your mission could be informed by what are you really good at as a firm? You know, it could, and we're going to use the example of sustainability moving forward. Let's say sustainable practice. But let's say what you want to do is actually focus in on your target customer, the narrowest set of people that either by typology or client profile that really care about what you're working on, that would make it that, and that you really care about what they're trying to accomplish so that you're just focused in talking to them, learning more about their challenges. And that's going to inform the rest of like how you think strategically about your services how you design your services. Maybe you move away from the AIA kind of mandate of like the certain types of phases, the kind of AI contract, because your customer doesn't resonate with legalese, right? So I just want to like kind of set the stage here that this is really an important step for the company to rally around. Then you move to problem, the problems that, that you're solving for them. What are the challenges that they face? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Value proposition, what, how are you actually like providing very clear value to them? And how does that, how does that translate to things like your website as an example, strategic differentiation, what actually makes you different from the rest of your of alternative solutions? I think that's another important way to look at it is that there's other ways they could solve their problem that doesn't require an architect potentially. And so how do you navigate with that? As an example, Monograph, we provide practice operation software. You, you could say that some of our competitors are other software solutions. I would say that part of our competitors is not doing anything. You know, uh, someone decides not to do something as a competitor, as well as spreadsheets are competitors to us, right? And so it's just about how do people solve their problem in an alternative way? Channel strategy is more, okay, like now that we know these things, what are the right places for this audience lives where they spend their time and how do I get in front of them is that TikTok is that like a website like all, all the things that we talked about previously those different channels like wh which makes the most sense for them and then you could think about monetization strategy which we won't get into as part of this conversation but um, I think it's important to, to to think about then about how you can move the needle on that so we're going to pretend we're a firm I'm just going to we're going to call ourselves future standard we are really focused on eco-conscious professionals, all right? So that's how narrow we're talking about here. It's like, we know that we're looking for a specific group of people that might have disposable income that want to do either 
It could be developers or it could be potential homeowners that really resonate with the idea of being eco-conscious. And that could mean many things. That could mean that they uh, really care about resiliency, sustainability, a bunch of different topics can be nestled under that, but that's where they're coming at it. Like that's the lens that they have. And so as an example, what we see here in this diagram is more of like what we would call like the total like uh, addressable market, the segmented addressable and sort of segmented obtainable. Basically like you're going from like your most niche to your broadest audience, right? So because many of us here that are in attendance are from Buffalo or operating near Buffalo, I think that's our niche really. It's the people that are closest within our city, right? As we start to expand, we might look at geography as the way in which we expand our services or our reach to other markets. Um, and so when we think about our targeted audience, this is kind of a preface of channels, but you could see here, like maybe th those people, uh, when you start to learn more about them, you realize, oh, they actually like read a lot of blogs. They like really try to keep themselves up to date with these issues. Might be very locally involved in different community groups. They might be part of Nextdoor communities as well on, on, on the Nextdoor app. They could also be part of Facebook groups that are trying to promote the sustainability within their community. And so that that's kind of a, a good way to think about the value of knowing who your target audience is, because then you start to understand where do they live and where do they, they share resources and spend their time. So if we then step back for a second and think about, or, or maybe kind of zoom into their challenges as we start to move forward, I want to introduce this idea, which we'll repeat here, which is like this idea that like they're on their own journey, right? And in the lens of a, a family, that is looking to build a home and they're a family that really cares and values this idea of being very eco-conscious. How do they even get to you? Like, and I think it's important to map the steps, not just after they get in touch with you, but actually what happens before they even come into contact with you. And if you put yourself in their shoes, right, there's probably something that's motivating the idea of getting a custom house built. And in this case, we're just going to say it, the trigger is that they're having a kid, right? And this family is having... Uh, is going to bring a new a new family member into their family, and that's the trigger. I need more space, which might lead to the dis collective decision of like, hey, we need to maybe think about a new home, and you know, there's nothing out there for us really. So let's go. Let's let's see what it means to actually build our own home. That would be nice. And we have the income. We're professionals, right? So we might have the income to be able to to afford this. Then the next question they might have, as people who are not indoctrinated or like have any idea of like how actually things might get built. So they start to do their own research. So they're asking questions like, who do we know that's done this before? Where do we start? They might ask, we need to find a piece of property to buy. Who knows a broker that is experienced with this? And then at the very end, they might say, who knows an architect that cares about the things that we do? As you might know, if those that work in residential, oftentimes folks that want to build a home might not even think that architects are part of the equation. We know that some of our customers get referrals from contractors that where the homeowner thinks that, oh, the contractor builds the building. That's the only person I need to talk to. And then they realize the contractor is like, no, you actually need to get a stamp from an architect. I know someone. Boom, right? Referral. But recognizing that that's actually the journey that this customer is on helps you then anticipate, how do I get in front of them? How do I help them answer these questions sooner? So then by the end of it, they're, they might think, well, where should we buy, you know? Should we buy this piece of land or should we buy this? You know, so those, those questions that are getting more sophisticated typically get answered by someone who might not be the best person to answer from like a broker. All this to say is like, this is kind of the phase that they might be in. They might then make a decision to buy a piece of property without being informed well from an architect as to what they could do. And then ultimately they buy it and then they're looking for those services, right? For, for an architect. But I think this is just important to think about when we're designing our strategy for marketing in general. It's like, what, how can we get more ahead of them for this? Because we then can start to understand what is the problems that we're solving. And in this case, here are just some, some examples for this model, right? For a custom home, we need to recognize this is probably the biggest expense they've ever likely will make or have made. They have probably very little experience with architects, the processor is zoning. They probably have very little certainty on costs. So they're looking for information on like, well, how much does it cost? What's the cost of building a house in this area? And they might not understand the relationship between those costs and also their values. And so I think it's important to understand that as well of the challenges that they want to address while they're going through this journey. So to summarize those as a maybe set of key challenges, 
how does this map over to what they're looking for? Well, they want to feel that they're making the right decision at the end of the day, right? This is probably what's prompting all their research. I'm sure many of you, when you're going to buy a new camera, you probably do a ton of research online. Just think about how many weeks you probably spend going through different articles to find like reviews on like, what should I buy? What should I do? Like, that's the same mentality that you have when you're trying to, to do something like this. And you want to feel like you're making the right call. If they have a family, then they might have additional criteria around programming. They might not really know even how to think about programming at all. They might have an idea, oh, we want a cozy home or, you know, we have the, we want to make sure we have solar panels, but they might not think, be able to think holistically of what that means for them. And so by the time they come to you, they might have preconceived idea that you're trying to sort of re-educate them on the fly, which isn't that great. They might want to feel like they're also actively participating in the design process. It's very important to note is like getting that understanding about them. If they're so research heavy, they might feel like they kind of know a little bit before they get to you, such that they feel like they can contribute to the design process. And so that's also where you, how, how, do, you, how do you design your services in a way that maybe helps them feel like they're involved without you know, sacrificing too much on your side. Now, the value proposition, all these things can then be mapped over to questions that you're asking yourself to provide value. So it's like, how do you help them make an education, educated decisions faster? How do you redesign your communication flow? How do you design like how you give them updates through email or whatnot? How do you design the discovery process to be able to tease out programming for them more effectively? Do you provide them collateral material for them to review a book maybe that you've written that kind of educates them on like, so you're going to buy a home, you know, sort of thing like that. These are just some ideas. How do you ensure that they feel heard and, you know, at least like they feel involved in the process. And I wanted to highlight a, a customer of ours that has an amazing website. They're called Culture. And what I really love about this website, it's not portfolio. It's not a portfolio of work, which is a very me oriented website. It's a very you oriented website. So all the language is about speaking to the potential prospective client about here's how we, let me build trust with you. Aside from the projects, the, the like it's too non-differentiated, you know, it's like, it's not competitive enough to just talk about projects. He's, he's trying to, this firm owner, he's trying to basically make, make it very clear that like, I'm here to solve your problem. So the subheader here is basically you can trust us to incorporate your values, goals, and practices into a cohesive design. So what he's doing here is also two things. One, he's trying to filter out people that care about having their, their values incorporated and their goals and practices into a cohesive design. If you're not the right fit for that, they're likely not going to try to contact them because you have very different priorities. So it's it's important that the language we use is also mapping over to the desired outcomes that we're driving and communicating the value goes both ways on that front. Um, for strategic differentiation, if you scroll down on that website, this is a pretty amazing little section. His strategic differentiation is that he's going to educate you at the very from the very beginning of the website about and earn your trust in the process. So in this case, he's saying it's an estimated that nine out of 10 architecture and design projects will not be built. If you're a prospective client and you're coming to this, you're like, whoa, what? That's crazy. That's risky. And then he's like, typically the causes are avoidable. Oof, okay, well, tell me how. And then he, on the right-hand side, he's listing the three different kind of main issues that happen. So he's educating people about the process before they even talk to him. And I think this is like, this is what we're talking about when it comes when it looks like differentiation, understanding who your prospective customer is. Like, how do you how do you get in their head and like understand what are the objections that they might have or the concerns they might have before they even talk to you? Okay, so if we go back to this question, moving forward, we're going to be talking about is like how do we then start to take some of these ideas we just learned and apply them back into this journey. So I, I want to talk about sales for a minute here, because this is going to help us help inform what does this all mean? Bring them in, but then what? From a sales funnel perspective, if you're not familiar with this term, basically architecture is operating on this idea that business development is distinct from sales, and it's not. It's, it's just a kind of, there's a historical contentiousness with the word sales that just doesn't seem to, architects a lot of times don't enjoy the word sales or they don't like to be sold to or whatnot, but really it's the same thing. And if anything, there's probably more 
out there in terms of educational content when you think about the world through sales than opposed to business development. So I think that's important to you know, it's like there's a lot of resources on sales, very little on business development. When we talk about the funnel, it's basically like understanding what are the steps that people need to take in order to finally sign a contract with you and then start a project. And what we want to highlight here is like just what those steps might be called, essentially, but also highlight that there's this idea of a percentage value. And so what we want to track in a spreadsheet or a tool like HubSpot, you want to be able to start to track the effectiveness of your conversion rates. So like how many people are researching stuff or like how big is your audience on different places? How many of them come to your website? What's the number of people that come to your website and percentage of them that convert to the contact form? How many of those convert to like actual due diligence to actual a contract negotiation? And then finally a contract signature. When you get to that level of being able to track those things, you then have a system that you can improve. When you don't have that, you're kind of running blind because you don't know where to allocate your time and resources on. You don't know if the actual the opportunities to help improve the way people contact you or if like the actual bottleneck is the negotiation of the contract because you have no way to measure the out, those outcomes. So if when you're able to develop this kind of idea of a funnel, then you're able to then, you know, as a team, depending on the firm size, prioritize initiatives on like improving those numbers. How do we improve our contract? Maybe we need to redesign the way our contract is written so that it still protects us, but it's understood. And like we, we reduce the time it takes to negotiate a contract because it's a one pager as an example. Or maybe we need to like make it so that someone can book time on my calendar on our website immediately, not have a form, right? Because that will increase the conversion rate of like contact form to due diligence. So I just, this is just kind of like the paint the picture of like how sophisticated you can get. And in reality, let me, let me not use the word sophisticated because I know that can mean like a lot of work, but it's not a lot of work. It's just making sure you're doing it as part of your cadence. The impact for this is very substantial, right? So this might appear like non-billable time, but it's actually like, it's an investment that you get a huge ROI from. Now that we know this is the funnel, we're going to focus on the top of funnel, which is the, how do we generate demand? From, from people and how do we look at our target audience to understand them a little bit more effectively. So it, when it comes to this, I'll skip ahead a little bit because this might not map over to the story too much, but essentially this helps you determine, okay, like what do we wanna move? When do we wanna, when do we wanna focus on this as an initiative? And then one way to think about that initiative is through value versus effort. And so this is the same kind of like the funnel idea I won't talk too much about this here, but this is the equation for any firm, uh, essentially like how you can grow is by growing these different metrics. You can establish a kind of very simple spreadsheet that's kind of driven by experiments where you just have someone on your team, maybe a mar dedicated marketer who has on a weekly or monthly basis is just making tweaks and just seeing like, hey, we, we redesigned our newsletter. Like how is that helping in our open rates? Uh, you know, all these experiments should map over to th those, those metrics you think are going to be moved immensely, but just wanted to show you an example of what a spreadsheet might look like where you're being methodical and rigorous about, hey, we're going to make this change. What's the outcome of this change? Was it good? Was it bad? If, if it was great and it did move a number, how do we focus more on that? And here you can also get to like more ROI. All right. So channels. So going back to this idea, that big list of the different ways in which we can put the word out there, I also want to contextualize that with like intent, just putting, just knowing that people are on TikTok is kind of not enough in some sense. You have to really understand how you're focusing your, your efforts based off of the intent that a person might have. Where are they spending their time that maps over to their desire to get something built? So an example of a low intent channel might be places where you're really kind of more like, I like architecture, let me browse to see what's out there, right? Like it's more, much more general. It's not a place where you think about like, oh, I want to go build a home or learn more about building homes or learn more about things like that. But so what are some examples of those channels? It could be academia, where people are interested in what's going on in, in architecture school in general, or it could be TikTok and YouTube. I'm sure there's a bunch of YouTube channels that those in, in the audience are subscribe to and watch that have nothing to do maybe with the desire to buy something, but it's a place where you spend time because you're interested in a specific topic. 
as you start to build more intent over time, you start to think about, well, you know, I'm kind of thinking about remodeling my house in a couple of years. Let me just start kind of seeing what's out there, right? And you might use Instagram to try to follow people that do this type of work. You might use Pinterest to kind of build inspiration boards or YouTube to just learn, watch this whole the house videos to see, well, could I do this myself? And then you might also look up on research content on, on places like Google. High intent, you're already like, okay, cool. I bought a property and I'm looking for an architect to design it. Where do I go for that information? You're likely going to go to Google, probably going to look at, talk to people around you and, or, or, and here's the cool thing is that as a firm, you do a really good job of kind of already being in these other channels. Then you're actually kind of guiding them down the funnel, right? You're helping them kind of understand the problems before they even get to this idea of buying a property. Because ideally they go to you first before they go to someone else to even to know, hey, what should I think about when I'm going to go buy a property? And the whole point is that you actually kind of want to cut people off at the past in a sense. You want to be here, be here in some sense, in some capacity, but in a way that's educating them according to what they care about, which is eco-conscious content. Another way to frame this whole idea is that ultimately people want to use design services only once every couple of years. There's not many clients that are looking to build a home every year. So if you think about the time scale of when people are making these decisions, you don't want to be in the kind of forgettable zone where they don't, they've never heard about you, don't even remember you. You kind of want to be really close where you're building a habit with them, where they know who you are. They actually are, have an interest in the work that you do, but maybe interest in you as people. And so what are, you, what are the use cases you're solving along the, that time spectrum? In the forgettable zone, you're kind of solving the idea of, hey, I'd like to buy a new home. But what you want to do is answer challenges that they're, they're having today. And those challenges are more abstract. They're more like, hey, I want to learn about eco-friendly solutions. I'm just interested in this topic. I want to learn more about it. And if you're the firm that's actually building content out there that's just educating them about that material, then by the time they come to, to this step of being, you're the first firm they're going to reach out to because you're the ones that have helped them educate them along the way. Uh, and that can look like on a daily basis, you're uploading to Instagram, TikTok, like high level content. If you're concerned about like, how do, I, how do I put content out there? Recognize that as architects, all you do is build content every day. Every drawing you make is content. And just if you rethink the way that you're actually a media company without knowing it, I think you start to change the idea of like how you allocate resources to that. So again, we're just going back to this. How are we then using these concepts to answer these questions. Well, here's a more explicit diagram. If they have this question, who do we know? Where do we start? They might look on YouTube. They might look like how to build a home on Google and it brings them back to YouTube. Or they might find a blog post that talks about all the steps on how to build a home or get hire an architect, what to look for in hiring an architect, all this type of content. And then as a firm, you have different tactics. You can either offer free consultations 15 minute consultation just to give some advice, obviously with maybe a pre-screen to know if they're serious, or you could also use tools like Facebook to retarget them. So if they visit your website, your ad appears in different places that they visit because now it's a great opportunity to just kind of be top of mind for them. So now we're just going to talk more about specific tactics, right? Because now we're getting a little bit now granular. All right. So word of mouth, like how do you focus on that? How can you control the outcome of that a little bit more effectively? I think it's really helpful if you start to be uh, strategic and rigorous about developing initiatives that let people know what you're good at, let people know what your mission is, let people know, help answer or provide content of, again, going back to the idea of the questions they might be asking today, your friends and family, local communities, your previous employer who might not have bandwidth to take on the kind of work that you're doing could also be a relationship you build. Also, coworkers, former coworkers could also be a relationship you continue to build. If you have a firm of any size, you're, all your employees should know how to pitch the company. Every single one of them is also a contr contributes to the business. Give incentives, give bonuses. If someone brings in a, a potential client, give them a referral for that, a referral fee or a bonus as a percentage of the contract value. You do these things, you will ensure there's legit incentives in place to get everyone on your team to also bring in more work. This is very common in other industries, whether it's like referral bonuses for bringing in new employee, you know, recommending employees. Sales is very accustomed to this. Most salespeople live off commission. 
where uh, a substantial portion of their of their salary is based off commission. So why can't that exist in architecture? It can. There's no reason why, why it can't. Foster relationships with brokers, real estate lawyers, and general contractors. And I think this diagram helps to elucidate why that's important. If you think about the frequency, the kind of at-bats that someone that you're trying to you know, incentivize with word of mouth, like how many times are they talking to someone else who might have the same need for an architect? This is the kind of spectrum. Previous clients, how often, depending on the type of work that they do, but how often are they meeting someone who's like, hey, I want to buy, a, I want to build a house. Like, where should I go? You know, like probably very infrequent relative to brokers who every day are talking to new prospective, prospective homeowners. And so when you recognize that there's a frequency kind of dynamic at play, where do you want to spend your time to increase the surface area of your luck? I think it's probably better that you're wor wor working on building a relationship with those people that maybe are answering questions in front of you or people that the general consciousness of homeowners relies on first before they come to you. This might be more in the weeds, might go over the head of some people, but SEO, um, search engine optimization, is a way in which you design your website in order to rank for specific keywords that or phrases that people are searching for online. Uh, we pride ourselves that if you search for project management for uh, software for architects, I believe we are still number one in the search results. So right underneath all the ads, we are the number one ranking post for that. And that's an intentional part for us to, again, how do we build content that helps to answer questions you might have before you decide to try a service or product out? In this case, I wanted to highlight Studio McGee. They're not a customer of Monograph, but they are probably the, they have probably the best designed website that we've come across of any design firm. And the reason why is it actually operates more as a content site than it does a services site. There's a lot of reasons why it's really embedded into their financial, mo their revenue model. But here's an example of a post that they write, the guide to outdoor materials. This is intentionally driven to help answer questions about like, how should I think about outdoor materials so that you drive exposure to Studio McGee or they're driving exposure to Studio McGee. Once people come into contact with Studio McGee, there's a lot more other content that ties into this content that it becomes more educational or it can lead people to build a relationship with Studio McGee. And then at some point when they realize how complicated, that's the other valuable thing about this, when you're painting the picture of how complicated these things are, people are more prone to, I don't want to deal with this. Let me just hire Studio McGee to help me do this because they're clearly the experts here. Another example is Marilyn Modinger, who we recently interviewed on our podcast uh, from Runcible Studios. It's a, a smaller firm, I think maybe about five people, but I just want to highlight even how she thinks about her blog. Tips for great tile work, bearing walls, can they be removed? Tin beds roundup. There's this way of thinking about also the same, trying to address the same questions. And I think this is also very important, having an FAQ to help educate people before your phone call. What you want to ensure is that people understand a little bit more about what the process looks like. So by the time they come to you, you're not answering those questions anymore. You're getting deeper into the weeds about their challenges. And the best thing you can do is have an informed client or increase the capacity of that client to be informed before you're spending time working with them. It has a huge impact on how you even provide services or their perception of your services. Um, other thing is local SEO. So on this front, it's like, how do you rank for, for your firm when people are searching for architects near me or architects in Buffalo? I think there's a whole literature around this, but I think just understanding that unless you have a great brand, people have no way to differentiate you or know why they should trust you more than anyone else that you compete with. And ratings are one of the tools that people have available for them to understand what's it been like to work with you in the past. So this is not something you should disregard. There's actually something you should completely lean into. And then for sure there's things about, oh, well, if someone gives me a bad rating, that should give you an indication that either you're picking the wrong clients or you're not providing services. You're not, something about your services not working out and you should take that as a real source of feedback. But the more you work on this, the easier it is to draw traffic in from people that are right in your neighborhood looking for you. Press is another outlet, right? So in this example, what we want to talk about is ultimately there's probably local press that firm owner, that 
map over to what your target audience reads. There might not be. I think it's very critical that you should think about how you get the word out of projects you've completed in general and use press as one of those vehicles. You should think about how your project ties into a story when you complete it. I would even venture to say that you should actually embed it as a phase, that non-billable phase in your projects as something you do either during or after the project delivery, right? So it's just something that like everybody has to work on. We're not going to set it aside. We have to prioritize that. We have to take photos because if you don't do that, then you're just, you're like not, you focus on the wrong problem in some sense. You're not focused on growing the business or bringing in more. You're just focused on, hey, I'm completing this thing. And if you don't take that time immediately after, it, it just becomes harder to focus on after the fact. And you might only wait till when you have an RFP in hand to think about where's all the collateral, like all this other stuff. So well, that's one recommendation. Podcasts, become the trusted subject matter expert. Put yourself out there. Go to podcasts, not just general architecture podcasts, go to podcasts that are talking explicitly about the topics that interest your prospective clients. So that you can then share with them, oh, hey, like, guess what? In this newsletter, I was on this podcast about sustainability or some interesting insights, or maybe you start your own podcast. There's, we're very transparent here about, about Monograph. Like part of why we do the podcast is to learn from the people we interview about their challenges and pain points so we could build better things for them. And also to build a bigger and bigger audience that cares about the same things we do, the values, the same things we do, it's on the same mission that we are. And so use that as another tool. If you want to move into hospitality and you've never done hospitality before, start a podcast where you're interviewing people that work in hospitality so that over time, by one year's time, you're interviewing the top hoteliers in the world, right? Like it's doable, it's possible, it's attainable. I wanted to focus on just like some examples of audience builders that might be more near, more kind of closer to you. Bobby Fijant, who is an amazing floor plan expert on Twitter, 20,000 followers uh, on his Twitter. And all he does, well, he does a lot of stuff, but a lot of it's just talking about floor plans, very niche content. Uh, Building Science Flight Club is very similar where she's done a great job of kind of building out expertise and content around a very specific topic that architects care about. And she's been able to amass uh, 92,000 followers. Let's look at Studio McGee, 3.3 million followers. And I wanted to compare and contrast this with one of the firms that I think a lot of people think about when they think about maybe marketing, it's like, oh, like VR Gengel is big, so great at marketing, but they only have an audience of about 588,000, right? And it's like Studio McGee has 3.3 million. Now, obviously they could be a very different audience. They're not developers, one kind of different mix, but I think it's just very important to recognize that um, if you really understand who your target customer is or tar target client, you're building content specifically for them you're able to attract probably a very large size versus like big Instagram, which might be very self-promotional all over the place. There's a lot more interesting educational content coming out of Studio McGee about how to do things. Okay, recap. What did we learn here today? Build awareness and trust with your target audience before they start looking for an architect. Critical. How do you get, how do you answer, add value to them before they even know you? Way higher impact on your conversion metrics down the line. I would even wager to say that even from a, monetization strategy, you have more levers at your disposal when they care about just working with you because they care about you and they trust and they have trust in you. Then if you're going in a sort of, oh, but your line item is this much, their line item is this much, like now you have not, no, no competitive advantage. Build a network that will continue to promote and refer work to you. And this can be motivated by other channels. And then find clients that are aligned to your value proposition and are ready to sign. Again, that kind of ties into the first one, but it's like super important to just understand who they are in order to attract them, build a relationship. More importantly, it's not even about building clients. I'd say it's just about building an audience. And I think that's the biggest shift. If there's a big takeaway, it's even using different language to think about your marketing strategy. It's like, how do I build the biggest audience of people that care about what I care about? Q&A. Okay. Well, Sylvia, do you have any questions? <laughs> Hey, George, thanks for sharing that. And while we wait for questions, also thanks again to AIA Buffalo, Western New York. I feel like it was really exciting for you to share all of the slides at the end of what people were doing, because while it's very important to understand what we're doing and why, I think to see what people do is really impactful. 
creating content, it's a bit of a lift, but there's also ways to do it that just promoting the work you already have. If you have old, lots of your work is photographed a long time ago, maybe updated photographs would be helpful so that you're always ready to attract opportunities and are already in the minds of people who are looking for like award, like awards time. You're not reacting to deadlines, you're already getting in front of it or finding podcasts that align and joining those podcasts before you start your own. Yeah, yeah. I think that there should be certainly an uh, order of operations. And I probably would say that if you do have someone on your team that is interested in marketing, if, even if they have a, even they're a project manager or something else, like figure out ways to kind of enable your own team to help think about the strategy. Let's say if it's not your strong suit, there are consultants out there that can help provide some guidance on strategy. I think it's just having it in place is the most critical piece. And then having a single point of contact within your firm that is energized by this type of activity and that wants to own it, whether they have a full-time role on it or not. If you find that you're always asking, first of all, if, if you find that you're asking questions, I don't know where my revenue is going to come from in the next six months. Let's say you have a tool, hopefully something like Monograph that helps you see that. But if you don't, then that's a, a serious question. That means you, you're not organized to have somebody that's actively trying to bring in work. So if that's not you, then you need to find the person that's best suited for that, whether an external partner, uh, someone you bring in, or someone just dedicated to this topic, because the lifeblood of the company is twofold. One, the talent that you, and this also works for hiring, by the way, like everything I'm talking about also build another audience, which is people that are interested in the work you're doing, especially when you talk about mission and values. But the flip side is like having that person that's constantly building your brand and doing these type of initiatives is the first step. If you don't, if you try to approach this from with no strategy, just, oh, let's just post their stuff on Instagram. You're never going to see results because you're not talking directly to anybody. You're just talking about yourself. And that is not just today and how things operate. People have very little interest in that. I also find that if you share more of the details and nuances of your design process, but no one knows the amount of effort and intent that it, you've taken to put in so carefully into your projects. So share all of those little details and that can be a source of content as well, or ask your team to also contribute. I definitely agree. I think there, there's a great question here. Any insights for a marketing strategy for an architecture company with a target audience of public agencies? government funded projects and such. How would you go about developing a strategy considering these type of clients most likely won't go through the usual Googling, but RFPs. Interesting case in point, we interviewed Angel Dizon and Curtis Clay from OBO, right? They manage about 20 billion worth of assets every year from the State Department globally. And, you know, I think one of the interesting things about that is one, one of the reasons why they came on, on the show is because they wanted more architects to know about how OBO thinks and operates in order to provide better RFPs, essentially, and also to stir more interest in applying for, our, for OBO. So I think the more you understand who those people are that are in those positions to sign off on RFPs that are the ones that are part of the selection committees, who are they? Sometimes that's public information, depending on how the agency is structured. How are they looking to make decisions? Angel Dazon was talking about how they go to institutions. They go work with universities to learn about the latest and greatest in sustainability because that's a big part of what they're trying to accomplish. So again, map out the journey before they even send out the RFP. What are the questions they're asking themselves? Where are they? There are probably searching for information, programming information, maybe a programming calculator because oftentimes people don't know, or like, you know, depending on the agency experience, there's just different things, right? You just want to understand, like, how are they coming to the conclusion that they need an RFP? And how can you provide content and figure out ways in which they might be looking for those answers? So they might not be asking, hey, how do I find an architect? But they might be even asking topics related to whatever they're trying to accomplish, whether that's a community center or something, right? They're, they're, they want to be informed before they even write the RFP. I hope that hopefully that helps. I really recommend that exercise. It, it's just so illuminating when you actually can see like, oh, there's actually a lot of steps before people even think about hiring an architect. 
how do I add value there? Yeah, thanks so much, everyone, uh, for attending. If you're curious about learning more about Monograph in general, we have great content around marketing. We'll share this uh, PDF out with you if you reach out to us. And uh, feel free to book a demo with one of, one of our team members if you're curious about how our software can actually help enable your team in different ways. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>